So it's the advanced training <laughs> program in uh, contemporary urine and psychoanalysis. We're going to talk, Mitch is going to interview Doug and Roger uh, and dis to discuss the foundation and scope of the training program. Thanks. Thank you, Dustin. We will, of course, uh, amongst us uh, here, be processing what Dustin just did after it's not the end uh, uh, of what it means uh, it's, uh, for Dustin to do this, for any of us, if any of us were in that kind of position. Uh, but I could see it activated a lot of healing for you. Yeah. It was, yeah. was provocative. Yeah. It's not even exactly totally clear to me what it's all about, but, you know. You keep processing. You keep processing. Yeah. Right. Uh, huh. Okay, so we're going to now transition into uh, the presentation for this evening. The three of us are up here to share with you our developments uh, of this, uh, what we call an advanced training program in contemporary Iranian psychoanalysis. Uh, for those of you who may not even be familiar with what uh, contemporary Iranian psychoanalysis is, uh, that's itself a whole story all by itself. Okay, and uh, um, there are many angles by which I could get into even that part of it. But what we're interested in here tonight is not even that level of stuff, but rather something in addition to that phenomenon, uh, contemporary Iranian psychoanalysis, and that is an advanced training program in contemporary Iranian psychoanalysis. Huh, what could that possibly be? I'm talking about a kind of analogy or parallel to what for example, the more standard uh, psychoanalytic type or analytic institutes in town might offer as an equivalent to this. Uh, that um, uh, if, you, uh, if one is interested in having a serious sort of thing that in contemporary terms is often called a psychoanalytic institute, in quote quotes, uh, then uh, having a way by which to uh, induct new participants into that way of working with the psyche, there are usually the different variations, uh, of how to approach this matter uh, is uh, commensurate with such an institution. Um, this was developed, uh, this whole sensibility, uh, at least uh, as far as I understand it, was developed a long time ago in the original psychoanalytic movement. Uh, when, as you may know, if you know the history of that, there were many different positions, both vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Freud and other uh, important figures, and how do you handle those matters, how do you bring about um, education and learning, when you want everyone to have a free mind, and we're all trying to at least hold to some sense or sensibility of what might be called individuation or the development of individual, individual self or self-becoming more so, uh, and yet, how do you also uh, be able to cultivate a particular point of view in an organized way. You, know, you don't want to be tyrannical on the one hand, uh, and yet you don't want to be well, utterly freewheeling on the other. I want to suggest this is what happened to the early psychoanalysts, for example. I've, I've been reading a book recently in regard to this history that I found uh, uh, nicely informative and illustrative of all these questions. And as you may know, I'm sure all of you are very familiar with various systems of of uh, either spiritual enlightenment or intellectual enlightenment, like in Western philosophy or other forms of that uh, 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 tend to be more mindful and such like that. They're all over the place, and certainly in LA, an area like LA. We can go to all kinds of areas. Uh, Kabbalah Center has been in the news recently. Uh, I just heard um, uh, KPFK, what's his name, on Friday. She knows from the what's his name thing down in Culver City. I'm sorry, I forget the name. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, these uh, alternative ways of looking at stuff, but if you notice, none of them, uh, no matter that there are any such things around, none of them are what, uh, uh, for lack of better words, uh, uh, today we might call homosexual. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Of all the different ways of trying to have alternates to understanding these things, or handling these things, or approaching these things, whether non-psychological uh, so-called or psychological so-called, none of them, nothing. It's about being what we might call or use a contemporary firm uh, uh, word like the word homosexual, same-sex loving, or gay or lesbian, or so on and so forth. Uh, that that overwhelming uh, central polar interest in, in um, experiences of romantic and genital romantic uh, sexual interest uh, and partnership as the members of one's own sex, whether or not it was thought of in those terms. Though I would suggest that it's always thought of in terms of the forms of experience that's being experienced in. And so what I'm referencing is a form of experience that in my opinion is not unique to any of us, either as individuals or in this particular time and place. How do we incorporate that 
in that new city and to the other uh, aspects or angles of what we might call um, psychoanalysis here or any uh, other system. We don't have to be with psychoanalysis. We could be uh, with um, um, a traditional, more traditional spiritual system. If you know any of the more traditional spiritual systems, uh, uh, you might uh, be able to appreciate why, in my opinion, on many other cultures, what we now call homosexual would have been uh, called, uh, for example, a, a guru or a spiritual master, uh, an alchemist, if you want to take a more Western notion, but also Middle Eastern too, uh, and such ideas. But where is that today? Where is that space today? Where is that honor today? And by honored, I don't mean making it second rate. I don't mean this whole story. I walk up and down La Brea, and there's a gay uh, uh, a temple there, a gay Jewish temple there. So that's an example of that kind of way of handling this issue. Like some people do try and address this concern I'm raising here. Where is the homo-ness of things that one is experiencing this homo way of uh, being as it, is, is, as it comes to one or becomes one or motivates uh, one's own being on this level of love. And I was thinking about this earlier, uh, the idea that we have, each of us have many identities within us. Uh, our ego is full of all kinds of identities, many of which are implanted from the world around us. But if I think about an identity based on how one's feelings of, of desire and love wish to come in, is it possible to shut the door for a while? That's too cool. We can open it up because we know how these things get so funky in here. <laughs> uh, but if I imagine the different kinds of ways of identifying, okay, there's an uh, unusual uniqueness to this uh, quality of love. First of all, love itself is a human phenomenon experience, but even more importantly, as we develop our bodies, we uh, start as infants, of course, and grow up, uh, and eventually become sexual, we call sexual beings, overtly sexual or overtly genital beings, that occurs according to these patterns of, again, what I'm using this four-letter word for, love, okay, to especially encompass this quality of uh, experience, of interest, of desire and self as of the another, the personalness of it, the intimate uh, interest of it, the drive of it uh, that comes from, we might call it the sexual instinct, if we would like to. Uh, but not just mere sex, all the animals uh, share that, certainly. Uh, but I'm speaking of a human, a human, the densely and deeply and richly, uh, most, most, uh, particularly to human beings. This, this quality I'm referencing here. To have an identity based on this, to have a way of being that comes from this. Uh, there are many, again, many kinds of ways we can identify. We have our culture, our history, our family, and so on and so forth. But to come from this identity, in my opinion, always, in all human cultures, as far as I can sense, uh, this has always been experienced by those who do experience it uh, as a particularly potent value. Not that everyone is not coming from this level of a development of the gentle sense of self. But nonetheless, when it becomes so fascinating and compelling and centralizing in the way I'm naming that's separate, that's different, and there are very many varieties, as you may know, of human sexuality. I don't mean to and just make it a mere <coughs> duality, but this particular form that is the way in which the particular uh, genitals of interest look to the partner genitals of interest in this qual qualitative way that is different that we might we might call it symbolically different than the way in which it is experienced by what we today might call heterosexual interest by virtue of its interest in being of the same nature, though, that we find a dialectic within the sameness, okay, as well as, for example, the dialect of the opposite sex uh, uh, having perhaps a twinship hidden within it. Mm -hmm. I don't wish to imply mere one-sidedness here of any of the views I wish to share with you. But nonetheless, uh, how do we honor all this stuff? Well, there, when I joined with Harry Hay and Don Kilhefner uh, uh, to start the Radical Fairy Movement back in 1979, uh, this was our interest. We thought this was the way to do that. Uh, Harry came, as you know, from a long tradition of activism, first as a communist, you know, in his youth, and eventually breaking free of that, because again, this homo problem, this homo issue. How could you be a commie and an upfront homo? Well, you could be like Denise Iger, what's her name, you know, runs that little shul, over on La Brea and call yourself a gay commie, 
uh, which I maybe he tried, but it didn't work. They, the others, the non-gay communists, didn't like that. Uh, and so he, just, he had to go his own way, right? And he, had, he had to say, if I'm going to be a homo thing, it has to be, if I'm going to make that this important, which I'm saying is not really done for, even, even though these are important political reasons, socioeconomic reasons, even historical reasons, but rather for what I might call for, again, one of a better word, archetypal reason, a transpersonal reason, which has always been there in humanity, to want to honor this love. To address those who wish to do that or feel called to do that uh, is what might be behind the impulse of all uh, ancient uh, spiritual traditions, philosophical traditions, speculative traditions, as well as other kinds of things. Plato talks about children of the mind as producing all kinds of uh, sciences and philosophies and arts and so on. But I'm referencing here those things that have to do more so with what humans might call love, but as it then uh, is, uh, on the one hand, romantic and sexual, on the other hand, is spiritual. My picture a great um, um, universe that I'm calling here human love, which has many particulars, mother love, for example, and then love for the mother. Uh, and I don't wish to define these qualities of love as altogether separate from each other by any kind of means, but wish to emphasize uh, this uh, uh, genital homo interest in uh, a form of uh, meaning, not mere desire, but meaning, not mere desire and satisfaction, but as true with all human symbols of meaningfulness. How do we learn, those of, by we, those of us who feel pulled in this way, how do we learn how to honor that? How do we learn how to support that? How do we learn how to egg that on and encourage that even more? Indeed, if we feel called to that, meaningfulness by the virtue of loving, that tend to be loving human beings, to love and be loved, that simple phenomenon, so that's where it's at, really. Can we be you know, loving beings or not? If it's certainly a bigger question if you live in an unloving world, uh, especially one that often masquerades as so-called loving, uh, and in all uh, cruel forms of these uh, human thoughts of so-called love. We could have someone who say, I'm so loving to you, but I should be very cruel and cold. What is an actual fact, very cruel and cold? But call it love. So I don't mean just the words here. Of course, I'm, I'm trying to stay with my words in a way that's really trying to honor that um, uh, uh, what's most important about any meaningfulness I'm trying to engage has to do with something much deeper than the mere words are controlling me. It's, by me, I mean my own feelings of being myself personally, as I'm with you here right now, and in terms of all the things I'm referencing to you, but I want to, do want to stay focused here on uh, uh, the central topic for tonight, but there are many interesting aspects of what we're raising, what I'm now referencing here, uh, and many avenues of exploration. It's the whole idea, why have a fucking institute about all this even? This is more than really having a book about it, for example. Why have a whole institute, the meaning of development of a community, development of a way of getting more into this, more serious with it, and not just in terms of training, but also in terms of, of study, of exploration, of experimentation, of application. But on a, on a more and more, uh, uh, if you uh, don't uh, misunderstand, it's too dreadful, the word serious, on a more and more serious level. <laughs> so what does that mean? I've learned over the years. I mentioned to you when I started with Harry Hay, for example, the fairies. And my spiritual interests are earlier than that. But by that time, I, uh, I had developed quite a bit as trying to integrate gay and spiritual and psychological. And I tried to bring that to the situation with Harry and John uh, Burnside, his partner. And, Don Kill Hefner, and soon got into the terrible problems I mentioned to you. And that all has led to historical development uh, amongst this odd uh, uh, sub-area of fairy, uh, uh, what we called at that time fairy, um, 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 gay men organizing in this form called being fairy. That went on for several decades like this, at least uh, in ways that I was more or less involved in. Uh, while simultaneously I saw that uh, to look to uh, handle the um, development of more of how to fulfill being gay in these deeper meaningful ways as from the sense of its desire having meaningfulness and what does that mean and how to apply that to even fuller gay self-development. How to do that? I thought at first with, to do it with Harry and John and Don vis-a-vis -vis the fairies. Uh, Lo and behold, it was mainly an extrovert sort of business. It was all about being in extrovert ways. And um, uh, if you know your Jungian typology, that extroversion refers to one of two modalities by which uh, mental functioning can, can direct its attention, let's call it. So it can direct its attention more so to what's inside its own process. That's what Jung called introverted, or can direct its attention more so to what's outside of its own process of uh, 
experience of, of its experience, uh, and that's called extroversion, what's outside of it. So they're both valid, they're both valid ways of, we, we must have both forms of experience, but they, they become political issues, both for outer reasons, you know, we have the outer uh, forces that uh, really in favor of extroversion because if you're if you get, if you get strongly connected in psych, it'd be dangerous to, to uh, powers that control uh, power in the outer world, so to speak, the world outside of subjectivity, so to speak, though, of course, I'm talking human power, and there's nothing really outside subjectivity, it creates an illusion that that's so. Uh, how does unjust power work? It must work by everyone cooperating. 